Uh, good morning. Welcome back. I'm David Blight uh, from the Gilda Lehrman Center. Uh, this session, which we want to get right at, um, if you think the last session was global, you'll note that this one is called Slavery in Public History Around the World. We're going, <laughs> we're going on a tour around the world. Uh, I think we just decided, because this group is, is so experienced and so rich, and everybody here run something or has written about this that, that, that we'd give it a nice vague title and they'll fill it all in with brilliance. A quick, a quick comment just as we start and then very quick introductions. Uh, this session is trying to get at the question of so why and why now has public history, memorialization, the creation of whole new museums, whole new exhibitions about slavery, and its many legacies and aftermath, recent great exhibits at the New York Historical Society on slavery, and many other places, uh, which had never been done before. Why, in our own time, <coughs> why in the last essentially 20 years, 25 years, have we been experiencing uh, a rage for memorialization, uh, a near rage to commemorate, uh, against the odds sometimes, but nevertheless, all over the world, new sites, new memorials, new museums on this subject broadly defined. Why and why now? Is it the end of the Cold War? Was it the end of apartheid? Is it, you know, what, what, what turning point, is it 9-11? Uh, is, it, is it this explosion of scholarship on black history and slavery and race and abolition, et cetera, et cetera, that we've all experienced in our lifetime, uh, that has finally, finally percolated into the public. Is it, a, is, it, is it some kind of, I don't know the answers to these. This is what we're all gonna try to think about. Is it, is it a kind of activism from scholars, finally, of taking our work outside of the academy? Uh, appreciated the question last night about, you know, why aren't we in the streets more? Well. We are, sort of, um, and we're also scholars. Uh, facing the past, you know, we came, we came to facing the past by facing the Holocaust in the last 30 years in ways that probably have served in complicated ways this problem and served back and forth. Um, are we in the middle of a long-term racial reckoning again, certainly in the United States and I think across the world, uh, the end of which we don't know, and many of times these things don't really have endings. Um, all right, I, I'm just trying to think out loud. What are the turning points? What are the markers? And why this is happening, or has been happening? And have we always been that conscious of it? Um, probably, sometimes not. Uh, Tony asked me if he could go last, which is his prerogative, he's our host. Um, so, and by the way, Tony, I apologize. Our banner we just had made is two inches wider than yours, and I, we didn't mean it that way. It just, <laughs> it just got ordered that way, and I, you know. And it's our first use of a banner. I'm so proud of it. We tried, we modeled yours, but it came up bigger. I don't know why. Um, That's all right, David. And the Smithsonian no didn't bring one. They probably had 80 of these things. And, you know, we're new. We're new to banners. So, anyway, so I'm going to ask. Uh, Jim Campbell to go first. It, it might be a fitting bookend. Jim was here, chaired the steering committee that brought all this about 10 years ago. Uh, and Tony can go last and in between. Taya Miles and Sylvian Deuf will come in the middle. But anyway, Jim Campbell, I'll be quick with these, is Robinson Professor of History at Stanford. He used to teach here at Brown as well as other places. He does American, African American, and African history. He's the author of Songs of Zion, the African Methodist Episcopal Church in the United States. He's the author of Race, Nation, and Empire in American History, and especially that wonderful book, Middle Passages, African American Journeys to Africa, 1787 to 2005. Uh, Jim's now doing a book on Mississippi in the Civil Rights Era, which has a, a, an important public history dimension to it. And as I may have said in my opening remarks, it was a great thrill to do a conference uh, at Yale about 10 years ago. I, I keep saying it's only six years ago. He reminded me it was 10. Uh, on 
repair uh, around the world, and Jim helped us organize all of that. Uh, Sylviane de Oof is uh, an, Af an award-winning scholar, but her current job is she's director of the Lapidus Center, named for Sid Lapidus, of historical analysis of the transatlantic slave trade at the Schomburg Library in New York. She's the author of numerous books, but especially Slavery's Exiles, the story of the American Maroons and Servants of Allah, African Muslims Enslaved in the Americas, uh, and also of the book Dreams of Africa in Alabama, the slave ship Clotilda, and the story of the last Africans. She's curated many exhibitions. She's worked both sides of this, as all of this group has, as historians and scholars as well as curators. Taya Miles is the Henrietta Graham, Mary Henrietta Graham, distinguished university professor at the University of Michigan, where she's in about five different departments, from history to AFM, to American culture, Native American studies, women's studies, et cetera. I don't know how you do that. I'm in three departments, and I can't even attend two of them. Um, she's the author of two scholarly works, uh, very important books, Ties That Bind, the Story of an Afro-Cherokee Family in Slavery and Freedom, and of The House on Diamond Hill, a Cherokee Plantation Story. She's also the author of Historical Fiction, the novel Cherokee Rose, which just came out last year. And with Sharon Holland, she's the co-editor of Crossing Waters, Crossing Worlds, the African Diaspora in Indian Country. And by the way, the novel is, if you've read it or not, all about this idea of slave sites. And it's like a travel book about slave sites. And she's currently working on a book. It's the history of slavery in Detroit. I came from there, so I get to say Detroit. <laughs> anyway, Anthony Bogues uh, is a professor here at Brown, did his PhD at the University of West Indies in Mona. Uh, he's a professor of political theory, uh, and he too is in numerous departments uh, and has numerous labels on his professorship. Uh, he's a, a scholar of Latin American Caribbean studies and particularly of critical theory. He's the author of Caliban's Freedom, the Early Political Thought of C.L.R. James, of Black Heretics and Black Prophets, Radical Political Intellectuals, and the book Empire of Liberty, Power, Freedom, and Desire, and he's edited a George Lamming Reader, among other projects, and he's direct, the director here of the Slavery and Justice Center. Okay, I've asked each of them to take no more than eight to ten minutes, and I'm going to bring the hammer down. We're going to keep this under some control, but I urge you also to look at the orange signs down here, or bravely put up, uh, with what, two minutes left, one minute left, no minutes left, no, no, no minutes left, and, okay. And then we're going to open it up to everybody here. So slavery and public history around the world, Jim Campbell. Um, let me just start by saying, I was having a conversation a couple years ago with a colleague and asking her what she was going to do in the summer. And she was saying, well, she would be spending part of the summer in Valencia and the other part in Florence. And I realized I was going to, uh, Neshoba County, Mississippi, to Freetown, Sierra Leone, and to Johannesburg. Basically, that I was going anywhere where human beings did something really horrific to one another, and people today are struggling somehow to come to terms with that fact. And she was going to Valencia and Florence. And I came home to my wife afterwards, I said, I really don't know what my damage is. And as I sit here today, I know what it is. It's all of you. Um, I'm in a room full of people who have influenced me and who have taken me on journeys, literal and figurative, um, and have shaped what I uh, imagine, feel, work on. And so to be in a room of so many of you who I respect and love is a great, great privilege. So thank you. Um, like the return of the repressed, we are talking in this country nowadays a great deal about slavery. Universities obviously have unearthed their historical pasts or in the process of doing so. There are some, I mean, some of the, the kind of stories, the metaphors leap out at you when they were creating the new interpretive center for the Liberty Bell across the hall for, or across the street from Philadelphia's Independence Hall, the most visited historic site in the United States. They unearthed right beneath where the Liberty Bell was going to sit 
the buried foundations of the smokehouse that had served as a slave quarters for the first presidential mansion when George Washington lived there in Philadelphia being the capital. Talk about, again, a, a kind of moment of return of the repressed when they were building a new federal building in, at just outside of Wall Street in New York City and suddenly uh, unearthed bodies and realized that they had unearthed portions of an African graveyard. The question that I've been asked to reflect on is the one that David just posed, which is, why now? Um, it would be nice to say, well, it's because we keep digging these things up, but we've actually been digging them up for a long time. In fact, um, part of why people were surprised to unearth bodies in the Africa of left from the African burial ground in Wall Street was that they thought they were all gone because in previous generations when they built buildings, they had dug them up and moved them. And I don't even think we know necessarily what they did with them. It didn't really become a thing. So somehow, when we discovered them this time around, it felt different and it required something different. And as you know, in that particular case, the result was a quite moving memorial on the site and it also inspired the Slavery in New York exhibition, which many of you worked on. So again, it's not just that we're stumbling into these things. Clearly something is happening in our time that has raised uh, historical issues that in previous generations might have been ignored or swept under the carpet um, to a position where a lot of people, a lot of institutions uh, feel we need somehow to come to terms with this. What I want to do, and I'm going to try to respect David's things, I'm going to throw out five or six ideas about a minute each that might be um, fruitful for us to think about. One is, as he already mentioned, the collapse of the Cold War. And the collapse not simply of the polarity of the United States and Soviet Union, but of a variety of authoritarian and totalitarian regimes that have sprouted in their shadow and the kind of unfinished business that such societies inevitably leave behind. And out of that process developed a variety of modalities for thinking about not only how you confront historical injustice, but how you in some fashion try to create rituals of remembrance that will allow societies to move forward. Truth commissions being one obvious example. I can say much more about all of this. Um, but I think that's just part of it. I think in the case of the slavery issue in the United States, the slavery reparations movement which emerged in the 1990s was, was absolutely vital. Uh, it was, as I'm sure many of you in this room remember, unbelievably controversial. The public opinion polls that were done on the issue of slavery reparations in the 1990s found it to be the most racially divisive issue ever surveyed. Depending on how you asked the question, something on the order of half of African American people believed that they were entitled to some form of redress in light of what had been the two and a half centuries of unrequited toil of their ancestors. In three different uh, surveys, 95% of white Americans expressed themselves opposed. Um, I defy you to find any other issue in which 95% of white Americans are in agreement. And yet, that, that movement, that relentless driving to unearth this issue, to insist on the importance of discussing it, the move in Durban to have slavery and the slave trade declared a crime against humanity in part to alleviate a statute of limitations problem that was being faced by the reparations movement, uh, the threat of an eventual pulling the trigger on a series of class action lawsuits, which ultimately didn't prevail, but that itself was really vital, I think, in bringing forward. It certainly was one of the triggers that led to the creation of the commission uh, here at Brown. And I really do want to call out the courage of Ruth Simmons uh, in establishing that committee. Brown was never a named party in a lawsuit, but it had been named publicly <laughs> widely, along with Yale, Harvard, and other institutions, as likely targets of litigation. And in that context, virtually every other university not virtually, every other university buried its head in the sand and said nothing on this issue, hoping that they wouldn't find themselves in court. And it was at precisely that moment that Ruth Simmons uh, said that this was something worthy of the university's sustained attention. <laughs> 
I think another thing that's very important here is a transformation within politics, within the West in particular, the rise of what philosopher Charles Taylor has called the politics of recognition, in which claims, uh, rights claims are increasingly articulated no longer in the language of the r civil rights of individuals, but increasingly in the right of people to have the collective identities that they cherished acknowledged in the public sphere including histories of victimization, histories of suffering. Uh, what all of that portends, uh, what it means politically, um, whether this is just a part of a surrender into a further kind of balkanization or a way to develop a more robust and rich and diverse sense of who we are historically is an open question. But I think the politics of recognition is one of the reasons why we have a Museum of African American History now, and we didn't have it a century ago, on the Mall in Washington. I think therapeutic culture and the trauma paradigm in particular is also absolutely vital here. It takes an effort of imagination to realize that what is axiomatic to us, that people who experience certain kinds of devastating events, that those events can continue to reverberate through people's lives and impair function, and that there need to be the development of certain kinds of therapeutic interventions to restore people to full function. That idea, which is encoded in the diagnosis that we know as post-traumatic stress disorder, that was only accepted by the American Psychiatric Association in its DSM-IV in 1983. It is virtually new. And yet it is now absolutely universal in our heads and in our language. And one of the things that has happened that I think is quite extraordinarily, extraordinary and largely uninvestigated is the way in which that paradigm, that trauma paradigm, has quite uncritically been blown up now that we routinely talk about in collectives and entire societies in that way that this is a society which has been injured, that this is a society with a traumatic past, that this society needs to develop some way of coming to terms with, of opening up, of discussing, of healing. So that a, a model that was predicated on an idea of an individual psyche has migrated now to become one of the fundamental ways in which we talk about societies. Last point that I want to make here, right, and, it, it, and it's a, it's a critical thought here. One of the books when we were doing the work here at Brown, we all, all of us, Tony and I, and all of us read a lot. One of the books that made a real impression on me was a book by John Torpy. Uh, actually, the first chapter was great. I didn't really like the rest of the book. But it was called On Reparations Politics. Uh, the title of the book was Making Whole What Has Been Smashed, which some of you will recognize as a reference to Walter Benjamin's haunting evocation of the angel of history being blown back into the future and looking at the wreckage of humanity and piling up at her feet and this impulse to make whole what has been smashed. Torby was very interesting to me because it was a critique of reparations politics from the left. We're all familiar with the critiques from the right. Get over it, suck it up, it was a long time ago, etc. This was a critique from the left that essentially argued that really the, def the, the impulse, the why question that David's asking was because of progressive paralysis in the aftermath of the collapse of the Soviet Union and social democratic regimes around the world. That the essence of progressive politics was the capacity to imagine a future. And when people lost the capacity to imagine a future or how to make it happen, the past, the past rushed into the vacuum. Now, I did not find that argument fully persuasive, and I believe personally that sometimes coming to terms with past is essential in order to be able to move into the future. But it is a sobering note that we need as groups like us come together in a spirit of self-congratulation on the work that we're doing uh, that we need to take seriously. Because as we have just had quite vividly illustrated to us, the achievements that all of us now can celebrate and have in many cases been part of about a society and societies around the world confronting traumas that previously had gone unacknowledged or forgotten has not prevented 
the triumph of reactionary political regimes all around the world. Thank you. Um, good morning. Um, for my presence, I, I would like to focus on the only two countries that officially declared the uh, slave trade and slavery as crimes against humanity. And uh, this is France, an organizer of the slave trade, which uh, displaced about 1.4 million people and enslaved many more. And uh, Senegal, um, a victim of the slave trade who lost hundreds of thousands of people. So it's not only for personal reasons, but also for historical reasons that I'm talking about those two uh, countries. And trying to see you know, the when and how and why and how. And when we look at Senegal, and I think it's true to many other um, African countries which have been victims of the slave trade, this history is not part of the historical narrative. It's not part of how people define their historical identity. Uh, but something happened, um, and roots happened. And that was for, for Gambia and for Senegal, uh, really the, the beginning of the development of, of heritage tourism. Senegal had Gore Island to offer and the Maison des Esclaves, the slave house. And that was really, that gave really um, um, uh, an impetus. Then there was, the second reason was really a UNESCO Slavehood Project in, in 1994, which, whose mission is to preserve and promote sites of, uh, uh, of um, memory, related to the slave trade. So those were external intervention, and that is, we, we see that also not only in Senegal, but in Ghana or in Benin, uh, Cameroon, Guinea, Guinea uh, Bissau as well. And the stakes here are economic. Uh, the heritage tourism is part of development. Um, in Senegal, there has been, on paper at least since 1986, uh, a huge monument museum um, which is supposed to be bringing in uh, quite a bit of money and uh, so the tourists would actually be paying for the preservation of Gore Island. Uh, it's a project that has not received a, a, a lot of support uh, in, uh, in Senegal. Some see it as a kind of a luxury project that has little to do with people um, with people's preoccupation. But we can also see that the emphasis on tourism has had positive uh, uh, outcomes. It has stimulated historical research on sites, on slave trade sites in other parts of the country, new research on Gore Island and the slave house, and uh, dialogue uh, between with other African and, and, and Caribbean countries. Uh, and those initiatives really involve Senegalese historians as well as uh, Senegalese public historians. So there are really a lot of questions um, there on how to bring uh, the slave trade into the national history and identity and consciousness. Now in France, the when is really uh, also very, um, very clearly marked. It was really 1998, uh, which was the, the 150th anniversary of the abolition of slavery, and precisely May 23rd. Um, as was mentioned before, uh, there was the silent march in Paris of 40,000 descendants of slaves, people from uh, originally from Guadeloupe, Martinique, Réunion, and Guyana, called the Ultramarin. And that march was to honor the ancestors. It was also to overcome or try to overcome the shame of sl slavery that people compare to the syndrome of the rape victim. Uh, but there were also banners asking for the recognition of slavery and the slave trade as crimes against humanity. And so it was really the, 
the uh, existence of a descendant community in the metropole that was the catalyst. And that was, we can see here, it also has linked to the mounting um, alienation and marginalization of people of color. And for the ultramarin, uh, spe uh, really specifically those of the second or third generation, people who were born in the metropole and uh, very loosely identifies with their parents' cultures, uh, but more with a metropolitan urban culture. And like many children of foreign immigrants, who also are French, uh, uh, they are facing uh, discrimination and unemployment, police harassment in the suburban uh, 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 project. And what we see really is that the slave trade, slavery, and colonization, which are part of the ultramarin as well as the North Africans and the Sub-Saharan um, Africans, this part of, of the, this part of their history is really kind of a counter narrative to the French ideals of freedom, um, equality, and fraternity that increasing number of uh, people of color have a very hard time seeing as being part of their own experience. Now, when we're looking at uh, politics and identity and nationalism, this law of 2001 has really uh, prompted a backlash uh, on the right. Now, they took uh, exception with the fact that this law concerns only the Americas, islands of the Indian Ocean, and Europe, and only Native Americans, Africans, Indians, and people from, from Madagascar. So in other words, there is nothing on the trans-Saharan slave trade and slavery, or the trans-Indian Ocean, uh, or intra-African slavery. Slavery. So there are accusations of pandering to the Muslims and the Arabs, of being anti-white, of, of exacerbating communitarism. On the other hand, there is also on the part of, um, of Afro-descendants, uh, descendants kind of a frustration um, because the Holocaust has entered public history much more. Uh, there is, since 2005, uh, a memorial museum and research center in Paris uh, on the Holocaust, and there are plaques um, uh, in the streets also uh, of places of memory. Um, so people are asking, well, is our history uh, less important? Are we less important? Um, now, in terms of uh, academia, uh, there is a, you know, uh, the promotion of research on slavery and the slave trade and the inclusion in school curriculum, but there's also a lot of, of, of resistance there. Uh, in terms of official initiatives, it's all usually been around abolition, um, very controversial monument to abolition uh, in Nantes. But for the community, it has really been around people, uh, around genealogy, around names, around the voices of the enslaved. And I can see kind of the same thing um, happening here. I think that in the past 20 years, scholars have produced more social history of slavery and the slave trade, more research on the slave experience, on resistance. And I think that's what really is what the general public is interested in. I mean, uh, from my uh, vantage point of being a scholar as well as a public historian, um, uh, heading um, a, a, a center on slavery, which is the only one which is located in a public library, I see very clearly uh, what people, what the general public uh, uh, is really interested in. And within a year and a half of our um, existence, we've reached really tens of thousands of people in, in, in over 60 countries. 
with a, a mix of scholarly con conversation, live streaming, screenings, podcasts, website, digital exhibition, uh, social media, really focused on the slave experience. And I see really a deep desire, a, a real thirst uh, for people to learn more uh, about the people's experience and how they resisted. Um, based on, you know, again, on my um, experience at the, at the center, uh, I've organized three um, events on Maroons and they've been a huge success. Uh, some, something that can look maybe a, a, a little very focused, like Islamic resistance in Senegam, uh, Islamic resistance to the slave trade in Senegambia in the 1700s has, has had major um, success as well. So what I can see really is, you know, this new interest um, in, uh, in France, uh, for example, as well as here, which happened really at the same time, kind of 20 years ago, I think, you know, besides those, uh, those uh, areas that, that you mentioned, I think there's, it's also a reflection of the alienation and the disillusion of people of color, the realization that equality is not achieved and that slavery is really at the core and continues to totally inform the present. And I think that that leads people to look for explanations and answers and inspiration uh, in the slave experience and particularly in the dimension of resistance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, David Blight put a very compelling question before our panel, and I think there are so many rich answers to the question that we started to hear that we will also discuss with all of you in the Q&A period. A few thoughts that came to my mind as I pondered this um, really had to do with genealogy, as we've already heard mentioned on the panel earlier today, and the ability for people to now crowdsource that information. Also, the availability of DNA testing straight to consumers that people are accessing, and the media coverage of DNA discoveries of African American uh, family histories. I don't think that we can ignore the fact that we've had an African American family in the White House, and that that family has had a very complex history when it comes to slavery, one that has been publicized in the media, especially regarding Michelle Obama's family history. But what I want to focus on is something that Dr. Diouf already touched on, and that is tourism. I stumbled onto a ghost tour when I was in Savannah a few years ago visiting uh, historic sites and realized that there is a whole world of tourism that's pulling in narratives about slavery that I wasn't aware of and that many of my friends and colleagues weren't aware of. It turns out that global tourism has really taken off in this millennium. There's a new book, a recent book titled Overbooked, The Exploding Business of Travel and Tourism by Elizabeth Becker that calls tourism the, quote, stealth industry of the 21st century and says that it has grown at an equal amount to big oil, big energy, big finance, and big agriculture, and that at least one out of every 10 people around the globe is employed in this industry. The popularity of mass tourism has led people in the business to diversify their offerings, to try to reach broader audiences. So that has meant a specialization of certain kinds of touristic experiences around things like ecotourism, food tourism, heritage tourism, and also what is known as dark tourism. Now heritage tourism is viewed to really have started taking off in the 1990s. And this is a form of tourism in which people are seeking to understand something about their heritage and their roots, often through visiting historic sites. African Americans might participate in heritage tourism by visiting 
places in West Africa, visiting the slave trade castles, or by visiting plantations. Trips that are not easy, but that can be meaningful. And there are also people who don't have histories of slavery in their families who connect to these kinds of sites because of regional affiliation or even a romantic sense of nostalgia for the American Southern past. In addition to heritage tourism, dark tourism is a form that has taken off, again, since around the 1990s. And this is a term that was coined by two British travel studies scholars who were going around the world looking at the ways in which tourism was unfolding and were noticing a pattern. And the pattern was that a number of tourism offerings were focusing on torture, suffering, murder, and death. Dark tourism sites often include stories about ghosts, vampires, and zombies. And they can be in formal places like cemeteries. They can be institutions like prisons and insane asylums. And they can also be highly curated sites, such as museums that recognize the crimes against humanity or the Holocaust. Now, ghost tourism is described by geographers as being um, on the lighter side of a very broad dark tourism spectrum. So whereas a Holocaust museum would be viewed as the heavy side, ghost tourism is supposed to be fun and frivolous and um, on the lighter side. It's supposed to be trivial. So it is ironic, or maybe not, that ghost tourism is a place where we are seeing narratives of enslavement in the South really emerging. So I think that it's a rise in tourism that has led to more interest in slavery, but that this is actually um, a Janus-faced kind of development. It's a two-faced kind of development. There's a study underway right now among geographers uh, led by a team including Professor Derek Alderman, David Butler, and Stephen Hanna, who are funded by the National Science Foundation, in which they are going to different plantation sites in the South and really trying to determine statistically and demographically who is attending these various plantation tours. And what they have found so far is that uh, a typical plantation tourist, not everyone fits this into this group, but uh, most people do, uh, would be someone who is white, who is older, in their 40s, 50s, or older, middle to upper class, and highly educated. Among this group, those who were most likely to want to learn more about slavery tended to be women and people earning over $100,000 a year. So recently, I did my own more impressionistic um, study of ghost tours that focus on slavery. And I saw a very different kind of uh, crowd there. I saw people who were in their 30s or younger. I saw teens. I saw children, people who were mostly white, but with a smattering of people of color from various backgrounds. And I often saw people drinking alcohol on these tours. <laughs> yes. Their class status seemed to vary, but um, they seemed to lean more toward middle class and even working class people on these ghost tours. Now, the kinds of narratives that we still hear on plantation tours that are more traditional or classic are problematic, even as many are making an effort to change their interpretation. And yet, the narratives that are being promoted on these haunted slavery ghost tours are worse, even more problematic, even more disturbing than what we're used to, which is really um, an erasure of um, telling humanizing experiences about black lives at plantation sites. On ghost tours, enslaved people are literally rendered as less than full human beings because they're ghosts. And um, they are usually connected with horrifying stories of sexual abuse, torture, and lynching that are told in detail, but in a cartoonish fashion that is supposed to make the macabre elements fun for tourists. I got a chance to visit around 15 ghost tours in Charleston, Savannah, and in Louisiana. And what I saw there was that any critique of the exploitative aspects of slavery were suppressed on these ghost tours, and storylines that turned on illicit sex and violence were exaggerated on these ghost tours. I'm going to show you a few images in my remaining time 
of a plantation that's a part of the whole uh, River Road plantation complex in Louisiana and Mississippi. This is uh, really a famous attraction for people interested in plantation sites. This is still there. I saw it a couple years ago. It's still open. And this is the Myrtles Plantation, which is along the River Road plantation sites. It's actually very famous for people who are in the ghost hunting, ghost touring community. Um, it's known as one of the most famous haunted homes in the country, and it operates as a bed and breakfast. It's located in St. Francisville, Louisiana. The Myrtles has a famous ghost whose name is Chloe. And when I went on the tours there, the tour guide only had to say, who is, who is this first story going to be about? Who is our most famous ghost? And the crowd actually shouts, Chloe! So people go there expecting to hear about Chloe. And Chloe, as the story goes, was an African-American enslaved girl of around 13 or 14 years old who was selected by her owner, a judge, to be his mistress or concubine. She was brought into the big house, and um, she lived there for several years until she listened in on his conversation and he then had her ear cut off for eavesdropping. This is, this is again the, the tour narrative of the Myrtles. She was banished from the home and she tried to get back into the good graces of her master. And in doing so, she accidentally killed his children by giving them poisoned cake. As a result, she was ordered to be hanged by other enslaved people on the plantation and her body was thrown into the river. This is a story that is romanticized, dramatized, and celebrated at this plantation. You can buy Chloe dolls at this plantation. You can buy a drink named in her honor called um, Chloe's Bloody Mary. And the story is all over the internet. Chloe is said to still haunt the plantation today. And one of the things that she does while she's haunting is she goes into the bedrooms of the bed and breakfast guests and turns down their sheets. So after being murdered and thrown into the river, she is still content with her situation there. I just want to um, point out that this is a Girl Scout troop on the right that I saw who had just taken the tour that I am describing to you and just heard the kinds of things that I am telling you about an African-American girl not much older than they are. So I want to return to my previous point that tourism is doing positive things, as we heard, for public understandings of slavery. It's bringing in funding. It's increasing public will. It's enlarging audiences. But it also has a negative side, and that is uh, the energy that's being created around stories like this that are quite disturbing, that do nothing to promote empathy, and certainly nothing to promote solidarity with the histories of enslaved peoples. That's an image of Chloe in the top left. These are people taking a picture of a very so-called famous mirror where Chloe's image is supposed to be visible because of um, the streaks in the mirror are reminiscent of the river where her body was thrown. So I just want to conclude with a couple of questions, and that is, if the publics are different for those who attend classic plantation tours and ghost tours, is there a way we can bring these publics together and to what benefit? And also, can the huge attraction of ghost tourism be ethically harnessed for the advancement of constructive public dialogue around the histories of slavery? Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, David. <clears throat> the, I think the issue of why and the way in which we have sometimes thinking about the why and then essentially place a set of very good historical reasons on the table as uh, causalities that might help us to understand a particular moment is always a good practice. But I think that sometimes we might want to perhaps have a different way to think about this than a listing of 
things, Cold War and so on, which I agree with. And I therefore I want to <coughs> begin my brief remarks with a comment from James Baldwin. Jimmy writes that history, he says, does not refer mainly to the past. On the contrary, Jimmy writes, the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us. End of quote. And I paused and thought about that for a while. What does it mean to carry history within us? Not the history of the Cold War or the history of political events, but what is, does it mean to actually carry history of what I like to call historical catastrophic events and their consequences within us? And here I think Jimmy doesn't mean genetically or DNA, but rather I think he means uh, to carry in history within us in a way which structures us, <coughs> which structures uh, our ways of life with structures, our practices, uh, our discourses, uh, and our ideologies. And I think this is important because I think one of the things that may be happening is that we have had a certain set of experiences in ways in which may we recall the past. That is, uh, <coughs> recalling the past in such a way that has been deeply <coughs> connected to power, that has essentially been a certain kind of interpretation, and that within that interpretation, the life of the enslaved has been sidelined. That we have spent time <coughs> thinking through questions of structures, thinking through the questions of the way the slaveholder looks, or how he or she practices stuff, but trying to think of <coughs> what does it mean to be a slave? And how does this business of being a slave or the, an enslaved allows us to think about not just history, but the actual present? And so that I think one of the things we might want to think about <coughs> is that in a moment after the civil rights movement, in a moment after the decolonization movements <coughs> in the third world, that in those moments which one of the political and legal results were, procedural formal equality, that is people would have the right to vote, that those pr processes of formal procedural equality did not do much to answer some of the fundamental questions in the society. And so that what you therefore had was a way in which people then began to think, not in large ways, but in small ways, in communities and groups, began to think about, OK, what next shall we do? And not even in those large terms, but just by trying to search through a different way to enact their own humanity, and I think this is really very important, to enact their own humanity in spaces uh, that they themselves uh, live and they themselves can create. Because the larger questions of the civil rights and of decolonization, while are important and seem to have put things on the table, did not necessarily resolve and settle a set of issues. So therefore, it seems to me that to think about these questions of history and public history and its emergence is to then think about history in a little more, in a little unconventional ways. To think about it in, uh, particularly in racial slavery, as something that was catastrophic, and that what happens when something is catastrophic, it obviously creates trauma. But it is not individual trauma. It is a, a certain kind of collective trauma. 
And then to ask ourselves, okay, what does, and I hear I'm not think, thinking only in psychoanalytical terms, okay, what then does this psych trauma mean in terms of not just history, but a sense of self and relationship to the society? But also, at the level of scholarship, what does it mean around questions of historical representation, or what some may call historical fact? And here, what you then get, in my view, is a certain tension between uh, historical fact and representation and a certain memory of that fact and representation. And what you therefore get in a moment in the post-civil rights, post-decolonization moment, is in fact people's grasping not so much for the fact, but for the memory and reaching for that memory as a way to explain and understand the present as they understand it. And therefore, it, would therefore, it seems to me that some, those of us who are scholars then have to think about the work of memory as part of, quite frankly, not just public history, but as part of history itself. Right? And then to try to think through what does that mean when you begin to think <coughs> through that particular, uh, that particular question. It would also then, therefore, seems to me that when one thinks like this, that history is not simply an academic subject, but rather it becomes a ground from which we can all, not just historians, but from which we can all begin to challenge the present. It therefore, it would also seems to me that for us to begin to do that, and this is one of the reasons why I think people are doing it in communities and so on, is that they are trying to think about not just the life of the enslaved, or its afterlife, to use that fancy word, but rather they are trying to think around this question around if, about if we shift the gaze from the top to the bottom to ourselves, what actually does that look like? And it is that shift in gaze that I think becomes really important because it then raises the questions of who can tell the story and how, very importantly, how can this story be told. So that when, for example, black folks in the United States say that mass incarceration is a form of slavery, or when the African-American singer Common goes into the library of the White House and begins to rap a song which has lines like, black bodies lost in the American dream, or begins to reflect on the movie, The 13th Amendment. What you are seeing here are not conflated metaphors nor language, which is what we like to say sometimes as scholars. But perhaps what we are seeing here is a way in which people are trying to deploy their understanding of a collective memory and trying to name something that they experience in an everyday life. So my point here, again, is really Baldwin's. That is, uh, what happens when history lives between us, lives within us? What happens when that history that lives within us is a kind of collective memory of a certain kind of historical experience that continues to shape us every day. I would also argue that there is a certain parallel in Europe around this, around questions of colonialism and slavery, the silences, the forgetting in, in Europe, that in the so-called quote, quote unquote third world countries, that this particular moment expresses itself in what is called the struggle for decolonization. You can't go to South Africa, for example, where I was recently, and not see the absolute anger, the a kind of visceral anger, what some people call a politics of viscerality, around this question of naming, around these questions of what is in the curriculum, around these questions of what exactly does the post look like? And why is the post so much like the, 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 the pre or the, the moment that it was supposed to follow, although it is not quite that moment? 
So how exactly do you know, name it? And what is my experience in that? And therefore, a certain kind of politics of viscerality, which we need to come to, come to grips with. What are the challenges, I think, within that context? Firstly, how to tell the story or how to tell this business of the past, particularly from the perspective of the end slave, which is still, in my view, something that we have to grapple with. Secondly, how do we actually create, intervene, and create alternative narratives? Thirdly, how do we use a certain, how do we deploy technologies, and Vincent will talk a lot about that digital humanities. How do we deploy the new technologies? What is the role of the historian of slavery in, in trying to understand slavery as a, as, a, as a historical catastrophic thing? Does it require a certain kind of false detachment alongside scholarly rigor? What exactly does it require? So also, what does the story of slavery tell us about memory? But also, very importantly, what does the story of slavery tell us about justice? What does it tell us about freedom? And I think those two things are really very important because I would want to argue that there is a way in which racial slavery is the touchstone for the emergence of the modern Western civilization. And that that touchstone and our neglect of that touchstone and understanding and not understanding that touchstone means that we don't really quite get to grips with questions of justice and to questions of freedom and questions of equality. In other words, what it means is that to forget that touchstone means that when I begin to talk of justice, I will then think of justice in very narrow terms. Or when I think of equality, I think of it in very, very narrow terms. And when I think of freedom, I certainly think of it in, narrow, in very narrow terms without understanding that this system is a touchstone for the modern world. And it is our grappling with that that would allow us to begin to think around these particular questions. Finally, I would just say that it is also, I think, very important for what we call public humanities. The humanities, those of us who are humanities scholars, can go to conferences all over the world, and every conference will say the humanities is in crisis. <laughs> it has been in crisis from I don't know when, but it is still in crisis. What is, to me is interesting is that there is the emergence of something called public humanities. We might want to think about not rescuing the humanities. We might want to think about what does it mean to, have to, to, to have define a public humanities and the public history of slavery within that. In other words, to think of the humanities not just as a rereading of the classics, but to the so-called classics, but to actually think about the humanities as trying to understand the ways in which ordinary people live, and to then begin to theorize and then begin to write stories, they begin to write you know, histories and begin to understand that as a way in which, therefore, the humanities cannot renew itself, because I'm not sure it can, but as a way in which we can develop a new humanity. So it's not just, therefore, us as humanities scholars or social science scholars bringing things to the public, but actually understanding that there is a way in which we have to have a synergy between so-called publics and the actual scholarships that we are doing to actually create different forms of knowledge. And I would just end there end by saying that I really think this is important. There's a Cuban poem, poet, Nicholas Gillian, one of my favorite poem, poets, who wrote a poem, writes in his many poems, wrote something on slavery. And one of the things he says is he writes his, he's writing a scene of a slave being beaten. And he says, Mendes lives, the corpse lives. And to me, the key thing to try and understand in trying to under develop public histories of slavery is to understand that life. In other words, not to understand the corpse so much, which is what we have to do, but to also understand the life. Not to focus on social death, which we have to, and not are calling for ignoring social death and, and all under and Patterson. But what I'm trying to call for is more what are the affirmations of life that we need to pay attention to, because those affirmations may be important for, quite frankly, our civilization. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, I'm going to open this up in a moment. We've got a good 45 minutes, but I'm going to explore one question with the panel first, which is essentially unanswerable, but it's why we're here. Uh, it comes off what all of you have said, but particularly at the end by Tony. Um, a lot of us in this room have been writing about memory. I've been doing it for a quarter century. I guess I was doing it before I even knew what to call it. Um, memory studies in the United States is now 25 to 30 years old, much older in France and, and Europe. And we've been struggling over time with, I think, quite some successes to get at this question, Tony, you're raising, of how do ordinary people remember? How do they remember collectively? How do they forge a narrative and a story in relation to what? Church, education, politics, and all the other ways that we come by the narratives in our heads. And everybody has a narrative in their head. Everybody does. But we've also learned here that millions of people have trauma in their heads. The history inside, the within, uh, as Baldwin said. Uh, the, the memory is, at its essence, emotional. We, we live in a business, we work in a business that is trying to work against the grain of emotion at the same time we try to capture it. Scholarship has to somehow get around emotion as it understands it. We've been trying to, for years, write the histories of memory. And we've done, there are amazing books on this. We've done okay at this. But here we are now um, asking, how do we link, how do we understand what we write, what we curate, what we, what we put on the walls of museums, what, what we interpret in a historic site, or want to reinterpret when we find it at a historic site, with those traumas. Do we know, as scholars, how to link those two huge elements? Is it the neuroscientists who have to help us more? Do they just get in the way? Is it psychiatry that needs to help us more, or do they just get in the way? How do we link what we do on this vast human phenomenon of memory? Everybody does it. Every culture does it with these problems of trauma. Or do we just keep naming this problem and then tackle it when we find it? I, I, I know this doesn't have an easy answer, but, but it really came out of what all of you, I thought all of, all of you gave wonderful talks and you only had 10 minutes. Um, Tony took 11, but that's all right. Only two over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But how do we find the link between what is still a scholarly enterprise and a curatorial enterprise and that trauma out there in those publics we have to reach? How do we do that? Better than we already have. I wouldn't want to have to answer that, so go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to jump in and just mention how I tried to address sure, it. I don't sure. know that I was successful. But um, the bulk of my work is on African American and Native American histories, especially as they intertwine around slavery. And I had realized while giving talks in various places that folks would come up afterwards and ask me about their own families, yeah, ask yeah, me how they could find out whether they had Native roots, oftentimes, um, and what steps they could take to uncover that. It was very meaningful to them, and people sometimes get emotional and sometimes cry. And I felt that the histories that I was writing weren't quite getting at that place that people were coming to me from, which is why I tried to write a novel. Sure. Not an easy thing for me. I'm still terrified that I put a work of fiction out there. But it was an attempt to move into this space of sure. um, imagined story yeah. that lives in the realm of emotion. Yeah. And yeah, yeah I, I don't, do I don't, it. I don't know how how it succeeds with that. Yeah, yeah. Well, fiction can get places that, right. that nonfiction can't. But you're right. All memory begins with family, in some form. It, it begins with mother, father, grandfather, grandmother. That's where all memory begins, and then that's both the joy of it. It's also the problem. <laughs> but anyway, Jim or anybody. You know. Um, a couple of quick thoughts. One, just apropos of what you just said about all memory begins with family. It's also um, things that we remember 
that's where we also begin to develop the human penchant for remembering things that we don't actually remember. Oh, yeah, right. Right. I mean, we don't All remember, the time. We don't remember <laughs> our birth. There's much about our childhood that we don't remember that we retail as part of our memory because we've heard it. We've heard stories. Mm -hmm. and, and that's part of what fascinates me about this process, right? I, I don't think that, I mean, it would actually be an interesting conversation for us to have that the problems of, if you will, the accuracy or reliability of people's memories. Um, you know, are they worse if people have trauma, right? Are they mm -hmm. repressing things? Probably that would be the case. But to me, I'm interested just more generally, I think that it's in the nature of memory itself, mm -hmm. right? That um, all of our memories are bad, whether they're traumatic ones or happy ones. And you only have to like listen to your brother-in-law tell a story when you were there and you start saying, actually that's- And every time we have the memory, it's different. Exactly, and in fact, the active rehearsing- If you rehearsing, believe the neuroscience. The active rehearsing in, in neuroscience actually is also part of a way of re-encoding memories that, that are also visual. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've been doing in the work I'm doing now, it's a, um, I could talk about this till the cows come home, I'll try not to. The, I've been going, I got very interested in, the, in watching the whole greatest generation process and the ways in which you see the congealing of certain stories and, and the exclusion of others. We all know the story of the Enola Gay exhibition that had to be canceled because we're not gonna tell that story. Mm -hmm. And it really struck me that at the moment that a generation that lived in experience is passing, that's the moment when societies have to, con have to decide, right? Mm -hmm. that there's, a, there's a moment where we feel a great obligation to remember. You've written about this in the context of the Civil War, right? It's that, you know, what we think of as Americans about the Civil War isn't what people thought about in the 1860s and 70s, it's what they learned to think about in the 1890s and 1900s. And the same thing I think we've just lived through in the context of the greatest generation. And in watching that, it struck me that, that the same thing was about to happen with the Civil Rights Movement. <coughs> Oh, yeah. That that was going to be the next major story that Americans had to tell themselves about what it means to be American. Mm -hmm. And I decided what I was going to do was try to watch that process over a generation. Mm -hmm. And I've been going into Mississippi now for 17 years and talking to people. I go to every memorial now increasingly. I go to funerals. I go to every anniversary um, around the Mississippi Freedom Movement focusing particularly on 1964, and particularly on the murders that took place in Neshoba County. And I'm trying to watch this in motion. And one of the things that's been most extraordinary to me are those moments when somebody tells me a story, and I actually have three versions of that story that they've told me previously, and I can actually see that story in motion. Or moments, and one of the most powerful moments like this that I ever saw happen was our colleague Charlie Cobb, our friend who teaches here. Charlie has a story it's a particular story of uh, <coughs> working in Sunflower County as a, as a SNCC activist with Charles McLaurin. And you've heard him tell it, he tells it in, I've heard him tell it to students many, many times in classes that we co-taught and so forth. And uh, I was taking a group of high school teachers on a trip to Mississippi and, we and Charlie was with us on the bus and we stopped and we picked up Charles McLaurin and as we got to this place, it was the little town where Fannie Lou Hamer was from, um, I, said, I said to Charlie, why don't you tell the teachers this story? And he started to tell the story, and Charles McLaurin, who was the other one with him, said, said that's not what happened. <laughs> and, and we all got to watch these two guys actually reassemble the story. And what was amazing about it was how many of the specific elements of, of Charlie's story, specific elements, a book, a pocket, a gun on left shoulder, walking down the street following him, were visual, and then realizing that those things had not happened. So I think it's partly about trauma, it's also partly in the nature of, that, of how we remember and how the act of stories, is a, of telling is a continual process of re-encoding. Yeah, could I just say, uh, jump off from what Jim says, because there is a project that's now going on at Duke University in which uh, the, those, a lot of folks who are involved in the civil rights movement are attempting to do something that they call critical oral history. That critical oral history takes 10, 15, 20 people from the movement and they begin to talk to each other 
And what you just said, I've been to a couple of them, what you just said about Charlie, has, and I, I've seen it happen. I've also seen it happen at Brown because we did one iteration of it um, here, at the, um, here at the center. But what the critical oral history does is in fact to get us to have a more complete story. Right? So it then right. says, okay, that not everybody's memory is perfect and that memory is actually manufactured and constructed after the event. And so what then happens is that there's a way in which a, a contestation happens between people, which it then gives us a full, a very full story. What is interesting is that we don't do it, we find that when we do it publicly, i.e. that when we do it in front of a whole host of people, it doesn't happen. But mm -hmm. when you do it with just them alone mm -hmm. in the room where they can actually confront each other without having to feel, you know, that I, you know, I, I can't confront or I can't do this and so on, that, that actually, that, that, it, that it works. So I would want it, us to think about questions of critical, uh, kind, of, kind of practice a kind of critical oral history, which may help us to, um, to deal with some of the problems of memory. Secondly, though, when I, when I think of memory, I, I want to make a, a, a statement which, which, which Stuart Hall made on a television interview in England. He was being interviewed by a British a BBC interviewer. And he says to the interviewer, every time you talk to me, what when I respond to you, I have at the back of my mind that you once owned me on a plantation. And that struck me very forcibly because he wasn't talking about a certain, tr tr you know, kind of individual experience. I mean, Stuart is, you know, generations away from, from slavery. What he was talking about was that there was a certain memory of, of, of an, an historical understanding of self and where one was located that actually was going to shape A, the questioner, and B, shape his particular response. And so <coughs> for me, the question of memory, therefore, in this kind of collective memory is not about a question of accuracy, whether it happened in 1865 or 1833 or 1735. No, what the question of memory is about is that you have a certain historical experience that continues to shape your present. Right? And, they, and, and that the, the, the nuances of that historical experience we can debate and so on, but it is the fact of that historical experience which you want to, which you want to bring to the fore. Um, I'd like to um, talk about what I've seen uh, on Gore Island, uh, which is really a site of memory. And mostly uh, the people who go there in terms of, um, you know, I, I, mostly French, but, um, and that's, I'm not going to really uh, talk uh, um, about that, but African Americans. And that place is really um, a place of deep emotion, uh, you know, where people go and they cry um, and uh, some scream. I mean, it's, it's really a place where, you know, the, the, the emotion uh, comes out. And it's not necessarily because uh, the place is historically very anchored, you know, into the slave trade. I mean, you know, there are studies which are being done uh, on, you know, the so-called door of no return and all of that kind of thing. So people know it or don't know it. I mean, I know that I know the story and I'm still very emotional when I go there, even though um, uh, my personal his history is not a history of enslavement and slave trade. But what I find um, interesting is when, when we look at African Americans who go there, uh, there is really um, a will of confronting the story. We also see uh, whether it's in Senegal or in Ghana or in other places that uh, people from Guadeloupe and Martinique, that is not the kind of, of, um, of heritage tourism, if you will, that they do. 
uh, they don't <coughs> go to Gore Island, they don't go to Senegal, they don't go to Ghana. And as I think Jacques Martial was uh, uh, telling us earlier, there is really for, for them this, um, this absence of remembering. Uh, it's really, I mean, it's very, very strong. It's very different from here. And I was also talking earlier about shame. Uh, and it's really this uh, refusal at some point of remembering this sentiment of shame of having been, uh, having had uh, ancestors who were enslaved. And uh, so we see those very two different reactions. Uh, one, which is, I mean, um, the kind of, for the longest time, of refusal to, to look back and to be, you know, uh, taken yourself by this emotion, suppressing it, suppressing kind of the uh, trauma. And on the other hand, you also see this other, um, uh, this other experience of, of wanting to confront it and to, you know, to try to understand. So I think, you know, this is what I can say about memory and, and trauma and history as well. And again, even if the history itself is not what, you know, people think it is. So, Okay, the floor is open. We've got microphones on both sides. How about we start here? And I see other hands beginning to show up over here. Ben. Oh, Vince, you want to go first? You got the mic. Go for it. Sure. Um, go over here. Absolutely fascinating panel. Thank you all. These thoughts, I mean, I'm going to be thinking about some of the things you've already said for quite a long time. I, I want to pick up on one thing right now which I guess is most directly engaged with what Jim Campbell was saying about the history of the politics of recognition and particularly the recognition of collective trauma, especially within the United States. And I guess I'm gonna pick up on some of David's uh, earlier work as well, which is, I, I just had the opportunity to screen um, Gone with the Wind for, for my students in African American history class. The whole thing? Uh, just the first part. <laughs> oh, okay. which, which ends with Scarlet, I will never be hungry again. Right. Uh, no, you didn't do a reconstruction. Very no. affective <laughs> moment um, expressing the collective trauma of the South. Um, as many of you will know, that film, down to about 1950, um, was the most profitable film in, in cinema history. Uh, um, and it replaced the previously most profitable film, which was D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. So, you know, already at the kind of like height of the Cold War period, as we enter the Cold War period, the image of the history of the nation is Griffith and uh, David O'Sell's next version of American history, which is fundamentally a claim to recognition of the collective trauma of the South, right? Pushing back that history. That's exactly um, right. It kind, of, it kind of a little bit earlier than, than we would date it. What I think was offered um, kind of to the others was, you know, if you, if you accept, if you become part of this particular American familial version of, of history, right? Development, modernization, the developmental estate is going to bring you along at some point in the future. And drawing on um, some of, some of uh, one of your colleagues' works um, at Stanford, who's written about the collapse of the developmental estate um, around the end of the Cold War, but even before that, and its replacement more by neoliberal global governance and predatory states, right, has led to a falling back on stories that seemed to work previously. And the kind of story that seemed to work previously, certainly in the United States, was this D.W. Griffith, David O. Selznick story of collective recognition of trauma, right? Um, that, that put the South, put white nationalism really at the center of the American nation. So much so that, you know, the last great Cold War Ronald Reagan begins his campaign for president in Mississippi proclaiming uh, his, his affiliation with states' rights. So I guess I'd like to hear, you know, whether or not you think that hypothesis for rethinking the history of the politics of collective trauma and recognition um, would suit you. Um, but also I have another kind of comment, I think, on, on one of the things that, 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 uh, that David said when he led off this, this discussion, which is that thinking about that history, it would suggest that you're right. We have to figure out a way 
of making our conventions for making truth claims, right, conform to conventions for stimulating affect, right, and emotion. Um, and I don't think that's a particularly, you know, difficult thing to do if we're willing to acknowledge the rhetorical aspects of our truth claims, right? Yeah. And to think more about the rhetoric of history, mm -hmm. how it is that we mm -hmm. align what we think of as standards for truth telling with what are standards for producing affect. And of course, many of our museum curators are already doing that work every day. So maybe a comment on the politics of rec recognition and then a comment on whether or not that's a, that's a mission that I think historians could quite readily take up as Taya has already been doing with her, with her novelistic work. Uh, w one quick comment. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do justice to your question. Um, there's a new book on roots by uh, Matt Delmont out of this university. And it's in there he uh, says something I didn't realize. Everybody knows that when roots screened, it was like the most widely watched television show ever. Do you know what its predecessor was? It was Gone with the Wind, which was screened at some point in the 1960s. And so the entire nation of America had its roots moment less than a decade before screening Gone with the Wind, which is a, is a kind of fascinating thought. Uh, this doesn't necessarily get it directly at um, the burden of your question, but it connects with something Sylvia said that I thought was also related to this. I think that you know, many of the, much of this turn towards um, a reparative politics, I think does indeed flow out of uh, a sense of disillusionment at betrayed promises of liberal inclusion. And so when you, I think when you spoke about you know, how the, this deep well of alienation that, that is propelling this, um, I, I didn't really have time to get into it, but I also think that's what's going on with the reparations movement, right? The slavery reparations movement, if you read, I mean, there's the long history of this going back 200 years, as you know, but the, the movement that we all were touched by in the 1990s. If you read the kind of foundational documents of that movement and as it migrates into law reviews and gets embedded in institutions like in COBRA and so forth, uh, it was against the backdrop of a sense that promises of liberal inclusion had been betrayed, that affirmative action and other form, you know, ostensible gains of the civil rights era were being rolled back. And it was this deep sense of saying, look, we are never going to be part of this country. And so we just let us cash it out, right? We're just going to cash out our peace and leave. Right? And um, so I think that, that you may be right. Uh, I mean, it's, it's somewhat orthogonal to your question. Yeah, I, yeah I, I would just add very quickly, though, Jim, that, that there is a, another use of questions of, of the word reparation in the contemporary moment. Um, which comes out of Black Lives Matters policy documents yeah, yeah. and so on, which does not talk about let's us cash and leave, sure. but actually talks about how do we transform this place, um, yeah. and it finds way and really is very explicit about linking up with other forces in terms of trying to transform the country. I think that's right. This was actually something that was really right. critical. Is rehearsing a conversation we had a decade ago, but right. around that term reparation. Um, so when the committee that Ruth started was beginning to do its work, I mean, that term was explosive. Mm -hmm. And what was really interesting about it was, when I talked to lawyers about it, they said never use the word restitution because that mm -hmm. conveys money or some material amends. Reparation is a much more generic word. It's a much broader word. It means repair, right? So that an apology, a memorial, these are all forms of reparation. So a lot of what we were trying to do, and I think it would be worthwhile continuing to do, is to try to actually reclaim that word, repair. Yeah, I, I don't want to hold back the questions, but the, the Vince, I absolutely, completely agree with you. I mean, some of us shouldn't write fiction because we're not any good at it. <laughs> uh, uh, Ty is. Uh, but, you know, so many of us in the Academy, you all know this, we're trying, trying, trying. You, I know you are, you're, you're a filmmaker. At the GLC, we've just hired a new, um, whatever we're going to call him, media manager to help us make films, to help us create bigger websites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I've had more response to two pieces I wrote in the Atlantic about the Charleston massacre and about Reconstruction than any scholarly book I ever did, which is always you know, kind of... <laughs> Pisses you off, but it's all right, you know. So, and on Gone with the Wind, God, it, you cannot overestimate that thing. 
in the book I did called American Oracle, which is all about the memory of the Civil War and the Civil Rights era, I have a little section where I talk about the narrative in the heads of the vast majority of Americans, including blacks, in the 50s and early 60s was gone with the wind. That's what you were up against if you were trying to show, there's another story here about emancipation. And it's easy to forget that now. And we just have an expectation that, well, why aren't we telling a better story? Um, anyway, but let's go back here. Yes, sir. OK, I would like to uh, take up something that you said and, and give it to the panel for their response as well, uh, David. Uh, I think there's a kind of memory that people have, but they don't know they have it. Uh, and it comes out in the form of hunger for information. Uh, I teach a lot of young African-American kids, mm -hmm. high school and college. Where do you teach? At Rutgers. I have a group called the Abbott Leadership Institute, and we teach leadership skills. And, and the two stories that I can always tell and revive that memory is one is about slavery and how African-Americans got emancipated, emancipated themselves with the help of whites. And the other one is the Civil Rights Movement. It's like a light goes on in people's eyes and, and they say, this, this explains something that is missing about me, something I didn't understand. And it explains how I got where I am. Mm -hmm. And now, Mr. Williams, tell us what we're going to do about it. And once you got them, mm -hmm. you can start engaging in that kind of discussion about what they're going to do to liberate themselves. So I wonder what you think about that. Speak to that? Sure. The hunger within. The way you express that is so much better than, than the way I was thinking about it a moment ago. <laughs> I was thinking about, um, in response to this historical trauma discussion, the longing, you said hunger, which is much better, I think, but the, the longing that individuals seem to have, groups seem to have, to want to connect with our individual and our group and collective past and to understand ourselves in relation to others to um, bring significance to our own, um, what can sometimes feel like small, um, isolated stories by understanding a broader context. I feel like so many of us have that longing. So many people in our public have that longing. And one of the questions becomes, what is our job, what is our role in trying to meet that or satisfy that? And is there a tension between the truth telling um, aim that we want to aspire to that Dr. Simmons talked about last night and actually meeting that desire which isn't always for the truth which is often for exactly as you put it um, the positive side of these tragic episodes in the past so not necessarily slavery but abolition yeah we like the end of the story right. everybody likes abolition mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. William uh, Dean Howell said that what Americans crave is a tragedy with a happy ending. We're good at that. Uh, Julian. Uh, thank, thank you so much. This was uh, amazing presentations and, and very complex uh, thoughts. I, I want to follow up on a couple of things and, and uh, I want to thank very much Tony for, for the way that you finished part of your, your presentation which is about life. You know, so you're, you're inviting us to think about life. And I, and I speak as, a, as an architect, practicing architect and a teacher, professor, that I, I designed the memorial to the abolition of slavery in Nantes. Uh, but, uh, but the question that I, that, that I want to follow up is this. When we talk about trauma, we're talking about the question of incomprehensibility. We're talking about the notion of a wound itself. Uh, and in a certain way, part of the problems of representation of you know, historical memory, let's say, would be the, possi the impossibility at some level to represent that condition of trauma. That would be one aspect. The second is that in reality, I think that memory is, I, I understand it more as an action than as an object. So I always try to invest this idea of memory as a verb rather than a noun. To remember is an action. And this action always happens in space. There's always a spatial relation to our memories. Whatever we remember, this room, the cookies in the kitchen, there's always a spatial component, the plantations themselves. So people long for that experience in space, uh, which goes not only to the question of how do we 
construct spaces, if we were able to do that, or how we uh, use the kind of, uh, in, in a good sense, the sites that are sites, of, as we call, or in French, the lieu de mémoire, the you know, sites of memory. So those are questions that are, that are pregnant in, in this conversation. But I would like to add one more point, maybe you can expand on this, which is an ethical dimension. And ethics understood as the experience of being in the face of the other, you know, the relation to that other, that other that we do not know and cannot be reduced to content. So I think what, Tony, if I understand correctly, what you're asking is in a certain way, how can we, through all our work in public space, in public history, in public you know, domain, as public intellectuals, how can we construct or help interrupt the present so that those voices, those very faint you know, echoes of the past can be heard in humane environments? You know? But in a certain way, the echoes of the past do you know, reflect on how we see history. And historiography projects a, a kind of a signification over those faces that cannot be reduced to content. So there's a big dilemma here in terms of the relation between the word public and history. Yeah. You know? And I appreciate very much this conversation. It's just a series of reflections, but I, but I think there's always a, a kind of a, a component of this, which is the, the, I would say, the incapacity to comprehend that traumatic history. Yeah, I, I, let me just say, reflect by saying, respond to you quickly, Julian, by saying the following things. One, um, that I actually had a whole sentence about impossibilities of representation, but can't, what left that out. But, I be, but it's really the impossibility of mirror representation. Um, and so that the, the, what I think is important for what I call catastrophe and wound is that there always has got to be an attempt at representation. But you have to realize that that representation will never be completed within itself. And, and so that there is, because once you decide that there's an impossibility of representation, then I'm not sure of the consequences of that, if, 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 it, if there's an ethics to that, because I think it, it also has a certain politics. Secondly, you are right around questions of memory. My words were to recall, and it is, that, it is that, it is not a noun, it is about an actual act of recalling to actually tell. Right? So, it is, so to me, it, is, it has both, both this, this business of trying to recall whatever it is that one is trying to, but it also, you don't just recall to recall, you actually recall to say something, you recall to actually to, to, te to tell something. And that, to, the, to therefore see it as an action, and I like the way you put it up, questions of space, because there's a speciality to, to, to this, which I think is important. And obviously there's an ethics to this thing. And for me the ethics is, revolves around not so much to use, I don't want to get, not so much to think around faces of recognition and to recognize others. Because I think that's one way of thinking about the ethics. And I think it's a way of, of thinking about ethics that has created a set of difficulties. Because we then const we do the ethics based upon relations of otherness and therefore, in my view, relations of power. That it might want to think around questions of ethics that have to do what I call recognition of another. In other words, that it is not about other, other in space and in time, but actually recognizing that we are another, each, and therefore how then do we then begin to construct uh, spaces of mutuality, if you want to put it that way. So that's, that's so for me, those are, those are some very important things. And I, I just want, I want to tell one story and then finish, because it, it blew me away when I heard it. I was in Chicago over four years ago giving a talk on slavery. And at the end of the talk, a African American and a white person came to see me and said, could we talk to you quietly? And I said, yeah, obviously. And she, they said, we meet as my, his family held my family in, as slaves. 
We meet every month as families to try and work through what that meant and what it now means today. And she said, what do you think of that? <laughs> I was just blown away. There was no, there's not, a, there's not a big <laughs> thing, there was nothing. This was just a group of people saying, you owned me, I, you know, I was your slave. This is the thing. I'm going, we're going to meet as families to think about this. And I thought, okay, let's just keep in touch and tell me it works because <laughs> I'm trying to, you know, I'm not, I don't think it's a national model, but I was, <laughs> but I was, but I actually thought it was, I actually thought to myself, this is really very important and how interesting that ordinary people without kind of help from other, the national things, attempt to have certain set of conversations. Because I think what they were attempting to do was to have conversations around reconciliation. I think that's basically what they were attempting to do. And that's the kind of ethical thing that I'm trying to think. What I think. On the a ethics quick matter. Sh a quick shout out, oh, a quick shout out, Ed Ball's here, right? And you know, who wrote Slaves in the Family and, and did this very thing. And there is a movement that's emerged out of that, the Coming to the Table right. movement, which is a series okay. of families mm -hmm. trying to do this. Um, but you're right. It's a, you know the, the part of what's fascinating about this is when when these capacities for empathy are engaged when you're dealing with an actual human being in ways that when you're dealing with the abstractions of people in the past aren't. In in the context of this, I want to also give then a shout out to Georgetown, right, which is the latest of now more than two dozen universities that have f basically followed the path that Ruth blazed here. But um, what's fascinating there is because they have living descendants, the nature of the conversations that are taking place uh, in that space are very different. And that's been extraordinary to watch. I'm the, sorry, David. No, no, it's fine. There's a wonderful book on the ethics of memory, just for the good of the whole, by uh, the Israeli philosopher Avishai Magalit. You probably know it. It's a short, wonderful book called The Ethics of Memory. <laughs> and among the many things he argues, is this simple notion. He says, what should people remember? And his answer is, not what is good to remember, but what we ought to remember. The difference between good and ought is very, is big. Uh, anyway, Wayne. Yeah, um, just, yeah, the many things to say. Um, one thing that I perhaps miss in this panel, and I, I want to push at it a little, is exactly the global in its, in its naming. So I would be interested to think through what does it mean to think these things differently in different spaces, um, tying it to the earlier panel, uh, especially to think um, if one talks about a politics of recognition, what does it mean to think the politics of belonging after the colonial within different political regimes? So how do we, um, what, what might comparative approaches do to either make our narratives work or have us think critically about them. That is one thing. And then just to go back to concur a little bit with Tony, because I've always been troubled myself about this thing of the impossibility um, as, as a limit and, and it, how we get entrapped in these tropes of the impossibility of representation. It's a lovely trope and I understand what it means. But 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 uh, uh, um, there's a lovely book by Didi Uberman, I think, where he where he where he, he he speaks to this. But one thing I I've always thought, as a very bad curator I am, is that um, all exhibitions that I'm going to do is going to be f going to fail. There is a way in which I know that that representation of practice is always going to come short, and therefore that's why I congratulate Nancy and all of you for what you've done, because a history like this. There is no adequacy to representing it. So we know that once it opens, the work starts again. And that is what is important to think of in, 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 in the ethical work that one needs to do. It's never an ending. It is never ending. And so the, talking about the ethics of memory, there is a, I think it is in another book called that, um, where, where Ricoeur speaks about the importance of, he's quoting somebody else, of, of that politics of, of debate and disagreement and what it might mean to open up these representational spaces for conversation, controversy, so that we can move to the next step. And so I'm always cautious about the impossibility, 
Because as Tony says, it leaves us sometimes perhaps with, with too little urgency to just do it knowing that we're going to fail anyway. So, but the global is my question for anybody on the panel. What might it mean that Black Lives Matter ties what I will speak about later on, the University of Color in Amsterdam, which ties to Roads Must Fall, which says that there is a global thing happening, not only in the internet sphere, but rather in other spheres, and what might it mean to complicate the narratives that we've come to write or that we come to know? I'll say one thing real fast on global, only that this renaming committee at Yale, the report of which came out an hour and a half ago or whatever it was. So what's the answer now you can tell us? I don't know what the answer, I don't, I don't know what they're renaming it for. I just know that Calhoun's in trouble. But <laughs> no, seriously, seriously, look, in our study of this, we looked at six, seven other universities around the world. And one of the things we discovered is what you always discover with comparative history, anything comparative, is you find more differences then you do similarities very often. Every, every story is local. Every story has its own politics. Every story has its own cultural context. But there are many comparisons. And you learn more about your own by looking at others. But we kept finding, well, they did it differently. They did it differently. Or they had a different problem. They had a monument problem. They had a naming problem. They had an ancestry problem. But you know, everything becomes different in comparison as it becomes richer. That, that's, again, what we learned from that. Yeah, so I, I, I mean... We're waning in time. No, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Wayne Young read a really good question about the comparative, and I just said to it very briefly to say that, you know, I think in Europe there is a problem that have to do, has to do with questions of colonialism and slavery. You know it much better than I do, um, around the business of how the Dutch, what Dutch, the Dutch memory of colonialism and what's the Dutch memory or the, uh, of slavery and the silences. I mean, I was at Oxford last week um, giving a talk, and the, what amazed me was, you know, I'm an old British subject, I come from a British colony. What amazed me was the absolute silence on questions of empire. I couldn't, I could not, you know, one forgets, quite frankly, sometimes, all right? And that there was, and that you were discussing things with people uh, in, in a way as if, and that they, you know, you, they never knew. You were discussing with a, you were discussing with an Indian, someone who was doing work on Indian textiles or textiles, someone doing something on textiles, and they had no idea of the way in which the British had, had, had dealt with the Indian textile industry, right? And who was teaching a, a yeah, professor, right? Like so I mean, yeah. So I'm, so uh, yeah. So there are a whole set of things which you could talk about, but people have their hands up, and I think you want to do it. Nancy, Nancy and the whole so, yeah. Paul and a couple of other people. And then we got one more back here if it's, if it's quick. And I see Paul, I see Paul as well. No. So I guess, I don't know if mine is a comment or a question, but um, the whole idea that we can't really bridge the gap as a historian between what people are bringing to us in terms of that level of emotion, I don't really see that as being a problem. And so I'm wondering, like what it is that the framing of what a historian does mm -hmm. is how mm -hmm. it's really functioning. Mm -hmm. Because if you think of the evidence that we've used in the past, it's all the same as what these people are bringing towards you. Mm -hmm. So that there's really, th mm -hmm. that um, the evidence that you're familiar with, the evidence that you're confident in, mm -hmm. the facts that you then lay out from that evidence is not that different from what you are calling memory. And so I don't know why we're actually distinguishing this concept of memory, which I think is functioning in this other way that, that people have been talking about. It's not just like, oh, I remember what grandma did, and someone says, well, she didn't really do it that way. But it's the fact that when I was a historian and I would go into public p places and talk about what I did, that everyone would be so happy. And it wasn't that I was telling them anything new. It was because I was a person in authority who was actually just confirming everything that everyone already knew. So how come we can't accept that as really being what Tony was really arguing for as the basis of our public humanities? And so I guess I'm sensing a little bit of these issues of hierarchy and of definitional difficulties that I think we have to work to overcome because I'm wondering how much of these structures of knowing are really entering into how you all are framing some of these topics. 
We could talk about this all through lunch, but I've given lots of talks to audiences that, where it turns out I wasn't confirming what they wanted to know, so. Uh, but, but that's okay. Uh, I, I take your point. Can I, sure. can I just um, well, ask before the, people the Ty has a quick answer first, okay. and then, then you're on, and then we're gonna do lunch. I just wanted to say that I think the- Where's this? No, Ty's going to speak. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. I think the context of um, where the research is being collected and how it's being interpreted makes a big difference. So we've heard shame a few times today on different panels and the power that shame has. The museum project is an expression of pride, such that people want to share their stories, want to bring their objects, want to, to be a part of that collective enterprise around a particular kind of emotion. So I think that there, there may be um, different uh, emotional inputs that shape the tension or the lack thereof that scholars might feel doing this work depending upon the context and structure. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a basic um, question that speaks to Nancy and also Tony. Um, public humanities, my question is, how much of the humanities do we want to have public? And I'm speaking as a witness and a participant in a memory as a historian where the public humanities of our community's memory is collectible. And then the term of how much of our humanity do we want to have public? There are things that we pass down privately within our memory to our people and children coming after us who need to hear that. So what is the purpose of memory? And I'm kind of caught in this conundrum because we need both. We need the sustainable collection of memory in a sharing, respectful stewardship, which is in the conversations I've had with Nancy and with Tony, with CSSJ, where there's a respect of the importance of these memories to collect a narrative. But for those of us who have lived that mirror, I wouldn't be standing here unless 500 years of us Cape Verdeans were alive. But as a filmmaker, we can't be collected to tell your story unless there's material culture, there's B-roll. But there is very little B-roll for us to put forward because we were never important enough to have material artifacts made for us or stills taken of us. So the question is, in terms of public humanities, how much of our humanity do we want to have public? Did you ask us how we use our memory to survive for 500 years, and I still have people finding me because I have, I have dormant seeds, and when the children of the future are looking for the story, they find me. That's the purpose of our memory, which is a private one. What is the value of our memory for us, and how does our memory become public for scholars? And I think that's a major one, because we have a right to reconstitute our memory privately that might not be public. And how do you navigate that space? And I think it's an important question, because I have the capacity and agency to be the author and architect of my own memory myself. Public humanities are good, but also where's the space for me to be private? Thank you. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> you're all welcome. Thank you. Uh, please thank the panel with me. If you